Burr Island is a little chunk of Devon detached from the mainland. The rest of Britain has lived through the Second World War, the winter of discontent and grand theft auto. But here, the age of Art Deco, Pink Gin and Hercule Poirot has endured into the 21st century. That's not to say that nothing has changed here. Burr Island has moved with the times. It's just that they've always been the same ones, 1927 to 1936 or thereabouts. In the 1930s heyday of Burr Island, it was saluted as the finest hotel west of the Ritz, and that was before the Swindon Travelodge was built. Many of the glitzy types who cluttered up the palm courts of Piccadilly could also be found shimmying over the parquet here. Edward and Mrs Simpson came to avoid the snappers. Lord Louis Mountbatten had a gay old time. Agatha Christie liked it so much that she set two of her books here. They were a long way from Mayfair. Guests in their pearls and brilliantine were obliged to share the island with a small community of fishermen. For centuries, people only came here to catch pilchards. That's why the ancient pub has such a fishy name. Burr Island is tidal. At low tide, you can walk from the mainland, as long as you don't wear your best shoes. At high tide, sea tractors have been operating since the late 20s. When a party was in full swing, chauffeurs tended to wait on the mainland for their employers to chug back. And if it was good enough for Noel Coward, it's good enough for me. The hotel owes its existence to solid Victorian engineering. Guest Keen Nettlefold made the screws and rivets that held the British Empire together. Archibald Nettlefold took his share of the family fortune, but didn't join the business. He preferred showbiz to wing nuts. So he bought a film studio and signed up stars like young Mabel Poulton. And if he was going to hang about with beautiful actresses, then he needed somewhere to entertain them. A private island was perfect, and he built himself a mansion here. Originally, it looked like an Englishman's fantasy castle, complete with concrete turrets. Villages on the mainland complained it was an eyesore. The locals might not have thought much of it, but Archie's show business friends did. In fact, he had trouble persuading some of them to leave. Noel Coward came here for three days and ended up staying for three weeks. Well, Archie must have got rather tired of these five-star spongers because from 1932 onwards, everybody had to pay. Archie opened his mansion up as a hotel. At the same time, it was extended, streamlined and restyled to look more deco, though it was never full-out Miami glamorous. This was a very English take on the style. Clean, rational, good for you. The ads promised a noiseless, dustless island sanctuary. You came to swim and play tennis until you were red in the face. You came to get blonde and brown. These were popular ideas in the 1930s, and not just among people who wanted to annex the Sudeten land. On the roof of the hotel, guests could play deck tennis, shuffleboard and midget golf. Must have got quite crowded. Archibald's Island offered sea air to the incurably sporty. Amy Johnson enjoyed some downtime here. The speed racer Malcolm Campbell slowed down long enough for a visit. A bright young thing named Pat, Oxer, also holidayed on Burr Island during the 30s. That's me. I've just got up. Yes, that's me. I remember that. It was pretty cold. <laughs> well, we loved it enough to come back three times, and I met my first boyfriend here. Oh, really? Yes. What did you bring with you on a visit to, to Burr Island? Well, we, we had a trunk each because we danced every night and dressed for dinner every night. 
I mean, in those days, all the women's frocks were long and they took up a lot of room. Who else was staying here? Oscar Deutsch. Mm -hmm. oh, he was the film director, was he? The head of, the, of Odeon Cinema. Oh, that's right. He was Oscar Deutsch entertains our nation. That's where the name comes from, isn't it? Yes, and he... Um, I always remember him, actually, because um, he was on the phone, it seemed she like all the time, and we didn't have phones in the bedroom then. They were on each landing. I seen a perfectly nice man, and uh, he went out one day. They came back just as the tide was coming in. And, of course, when the tide came in, we were a complete island. He wouldn't listen, he risked taking his car. And, of course, he didn't reach here without the car going right under. So the car got stuck in the sand <laughs> and he bailed out? The next day, when they salvaged it, it was um, quite rusty. For movie moguls like Oscar, being out at sea, albeit only a couple of hundred feet out at sea, was Burr Island's principal selling point. All those upscale London types would hardly want to sit on the prom at Worthing, nursing a punnet of whelks. Cut off from the mainland, it was the perfect place for 1930 celebs to come, take off most of their clothes and lie down in a sun lounger without anybody coming up to them and prodding them with a little spade and saying, are you that Agatha Christie? If you know you, Christy, you'll recall the holiday retreat in Evil Under the Sun, where Hercule Poirot unravels a mystery involving a man-eating actress, a mentally ill vicar, hard drugs and voodoo. The film version with Peter Ustinov was filmed in Mallorca, but that's only because the director was a British tax exile and wouldn't have been able to spend enough time where the book is actually set, Burr Island. Christie changed the name to Smuggler's Island, but the map at the front of the book is clearly modelled on the Devon original, and the plot hinges on the resort's facilities and landscaping. Before the war, you could descend to the beach using a Jacob's Ladder which hung here. In the book, it becomes the crucial escape route for the devious former games mistress. The pair of scissors she drops while shinning up give the Belgian detective a vital clue. Down in that cave, smugglers stash heroin. And if that had a real-life inspiration, Agatha didn't fess up to customs and excise. Christie's characters like the Island Hotel because it's very exclusive, with no trippers or sharabangs. The snobbery shouldn't be mistaken as Agatha's own. She's actually an acute satirist of the English class system. Christie isn't taken very seriously as an author, mainly because I think of the very high body count in her books. But there's more to them than people being stabbed with hat pins and drinking cyanide. Evil Under the Sun is a book about people in bathing costumes being fantastically nasty about each other. Another of Christie's bizarre multiple murder stories is set on Burr Island. In recent years, it's been known as And Then There Were None, but it was originally published under a different name. Language like the N-word is one aspect of the 1930s about which nobody should feel nostalgic. But an earlier occupant of this island based a highly successful career around a lexicon that these days would cause a public outcry. Next door to the hotel is a wooden building dating from 1896. It was once a guest house run by one of the oddest terms that the British Music Hall ever produced. George Chergwin called himself the White-Eyed Kaffir and looked like the product of a genetic experiment involving David Bowie and a black-and-white minstrel. Through Al Jolson, we're familiar with the stylized racial impersonations of the 19th and early 20th century stage. Sure enough, Chergwin's repertoire included character songs which couldn't possibly be performed today. But Chergwin pushed the blackface act into rather more surreal territory. He played the cello, the banjo, the Japanese one-string fiddle and a series of bizarre musical instruments of his own devising. His signature song was a sentimental number called The Blind Boy, which he sang in a warbling falsetto voice. He wouldn't have looked out of place in some Dadaist jamboree in 1920s Berlin. 
For variety's sake, he occasionally reversed the makeup. The act was successful enough for him to buy the whole of Burr Island. He modestly renamed it Chergwin Island and is pictured here playing snooker on it. He eventually retired to run a pub in Shepperton. The island renewed its music hall associations in the late 30s when a seasoned old turn named Whit Cunliffe arrived as the hotel's general manager. He usually wore a brown suit, brown shoes and a brown hat and was billed as bright, brown and breezy. It was Whit Cunliffe who, in 1939, was confronted by an army officer telling him to take down the Jacob's Ladder in case the Germans landed. The officer in question recorded that Cunliffe didn't exactly take the news in a bright and breezy manner, and with good reason. The hotel was forced to close, Wit was forced to leave, and he ended up living in a caravan on the mainland. During the war, the causeway was booby-trapped with anti-tank devices. But in May 1942, a German bomb scalped the hotel of its top two floors. Though the damage was repaired, by the 1950s, Burr Island was looking hopelessly outmoded, a relic of an ever more distant era. It lost its original owners, its self-confidence and an awful lot of money. Worse indignities were to come. By the early 60s, the building had been transformed into a series of self-catering apartments, the first of their kind in the country. At that point, the bedrooms certainly didn't look like this. Cocktails and dinner at eight were out. In came Baby Bellings and Bovril à deux. The concept worked fine during the summer, when these rooms were packed with people paying ten shillings a head. But for nine months of the year, they were cold, empty, exposed to the elements, and suitable only for a clientele of the brass monkey sort. The exterior of the building was still unusual enough to make it the backdrop of this fashion shoot in the 1970s. By then, things were looking a bit bare on the inside, too. At the start of the 80s, a development company won planning permission to turn the hotel into timeshare flats. That's when Burr Island really hit rock bottom. The developers planned to destroy the Deco Dome to make way for a swimming pool and other 30s features were marked for the scrap heap. The restaurant was nearly destroyed. They were planning to split it up into flats. They made a bonfire on the beach of many of the original Art Deco fittings. At least this fireplace survived. Fortunately for posterity, the scheme floundered and the dilapidated building was bought instead by a pair of Deco enthusiasts. They slowly restored the hotel and its reputation, a process still going on today under the latest owners. Thanks to their work, the hotel has never been more perfectly 1930s, much more so than it was in the 1930s. What was originally a fairly homely interior has become ever more deco. This mural, for instance, only arrived in the 21st century. Some of today's wealthier guests arrive by modern modes of transport, but it's the 1930s which has really brought them here. There are no televisions in the rooms, but twiddle that knob and you might get the home service. Mobiles don't work, and you couldn't text anyone from this. So what you haven't done here is restore it to exactly how it was in 1932, have you? Something very different. No, no. You'd have, um, you know, you'd have communal bathrooms down the hall and things like that. We don't um, make it altogether too authentic, and we don't um, get into a theme park land. We have tried to restore it to um, the, your mind's eye of the 30s. Why do you think it is that the 30s are so appealing to people? Um, it's very hackneyed um, to say so, but, but it was a very edgy decade. You've got storm clouds around the place, but you still have people partying the night away um, because they feel they have to, almost, and they're driven to it. Um, and there's something very sexy about that. And the dressing up aspect is enormously important here, and I suspect we're the only place in Britain, including the, you know, the biggest hotels in London, etc., where we, we don't in insist but there's a very strong presumption uh, that people will dress for dinner, and that does give the gentlemen and the ladies that panache. To some extent, the dressing up on Burr Island today is as surreal as George Chergwin's. The guests are no more 1930s smart set than he was a white-eyed kaffir. The hotel allows people to experience the deco decade cleansed of any negative associations, 
like the bread line or the black shirts marching through the East End. It's history as cocktail party. Who knows what they're wearing over on the mainland? Golfing slacks and Pringle sweaters, I should imagine. But over here on Burr Island, it'll always be 1932. And it'll be more and more 1932 with every year that passes. Mm -hmm.